Thank you, Nancy, for joining me today. I'm so excited to talk to you about the work of Shivanai Ashuna. Um, having her at Glembo, having her work at Glembo has been really incredible. The, the just the sheer scale of her drawings is so. Um, it feels like you could walk right into them, the, these whole other worlds that she's created. And I'm so excited to learn more about them with you. art for, for many years and, and working with Inuit artists. What is it that draws you to Shuvanai Ashuna's work? Well, Shuvanai is one of uh, many artists I've gotten to know in the community of Kingite, uh, formerly known as Cape Dorset. And I had the good fortune about 15 years ago to go up there uh, and meet the artists that were working there in the studios. And I had particular interest in Annie Pudigu and Shuvanaya Shuna uh, because what I saw in their work as a contemporary art curator was something that was really contemporary. It wasn't what most people expect when they walk into a show of Inuit art. They would expect, you know, soap stone sculptures or prints or very emblematic drawings, like something that Kanoyuak Ashavak would do, the Enchanted Owl, people might know that. And, um, but these two women in particular really captured my attention and I ended up spending uh, a lot of time over the years interviewing these artists. They were just something that seems so contemporary, but yet still very based in their Inuit culture. You visited Kingite many times, where she and I grew, grew up and where she now lives. Um, can you tell us about what it's like there? What does it feel like when you get there and, and what's the environment like? Well, it's a, a really special place for me. I've had many opportunities to visit. So I feel like it's going home in many ways. Uh, what people don't really understand is, is how far north it is. Uh, for me, living in Toronto, you have to fly to Ottawa. Then you have to fly to Iqaluit, which is at least a four hour flight, usually on a cargo plane. And then from Iqaluit, you take another plane to the community if the weather's okay. Uh, many times I've been stuck there for up to five days, just trying to get out. Um, and so it's, it's just perched on, on the edge of Baffin Island in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, you know, it, it's snowing most of the time or snowy. I have also been there in the summer, which is equally as beautiful. They've got, they're right on the bay. So you have the water, you have the mountain. Kingite actually means uh, mountain. Uh, mountain for you in Calgary is a bit of an overstatement, but um, you know, it's quite rocky. There's uh, no trees. It's above the tree line. So there's, you know, tundra and scruff. Um, small prefab houses kind of dot the whole town. Uh, there's a couple of roads, not very, very many vehicles. Most people use snowmobiles most of the time. Um, a little tiny airport and uh, where everyone comes to meet you, not just the artist. I mean, like everybody comes to meet you. <laughs> and uh, at one time there was one restaurant, but currently there is no restaurant. Uh, so it's really for someone who lives in a city like Toronto or Calgary, it's, it's really the antithesis of what is familiar. Up until very recently, they had no internet, um, you know, no cell phones. They certainly had television, but um, very limited uh, broadband. Now they seem to have much better, which is fantastic, but that will change the community as well. You know, you still see a lot of people hunting and fishing and 
berry picking and you know eating whale and eating seal and having feasts um and you know the other side of it is you know they're making craft dinner in their house with the television on so it's really extraordinary experience if anyone has the the opportunity um it, it's uh it's not for everyone but it certainly is for me if you could tell me a bit about uh, what artistic life is like in Kingate. Um, I've heard that there are more art artists per capita there than anywhere else in the world. That's true on the on their tax returns or whatever, wherever you write your occupation. Um, a lot of people claim art as their primary uh, vocation. It is seen as a vocation, not a passion. Um, the co-op is open to any artist who wants to produce art and that includes sculpture prints and drawings um, you used to see a lot more people in the studios now more people work from home but um, at any time you'd see three or four generations typically they have children very young so it's possible to see um, you know great grandmothers drawing alongside granddaughters. Um, typically the women mostly draw and the men are the printmakers and the carvers, but that's not exclusive. But I would say that's in general what, what the breakup is. And, and they run it like an office, like Monday to Friday, nine to five, coffee at 10, coffee at three and lunch from 12 to one. And it, at five o'clock, it is empty. So it's, um, it's a job. They have a very unique system. The co-op is Inuit run and um, Inuit managed, and it has been uh, in operation since 1950. So it's the longest running print studio, I think, in the world. Um, and, you know, they produce prints every year the the annual print release still comes out every year from cape dorset but increasingly they're becoming known for their drawings and certainly people like annie pudugu and shuvanaya shuna have really broadened the scope of what inuit art can be not only nationally but internationally um so it's a very unique model where the artists really um, try it out and learn from the people they work around. So you'll see a lot of people when they're starting, their, their work resembles work of the people that they're working alongside. Or if something sells for a really good price, you'll see the artists try to replicate what, what seems to be selling at the time. But eventually people like Shiva and I and Annie come into their own style, their own way. And certainly Shiva and I is one of the top earners at the studio at, at the moment. And she works very hard. She's there every day. Well, let's talk a little bit about her work then. Um, as you said, it, it is quite different from the traditional practice um, and the work that has come out of the studio in past years. Um, she works on such a large scale and she uses pencil crayon, which is um, such a specific material. Can you talk a bit about her, her practice and the physicality of her work and what it is that she does? Okay, well, I'll start with the pencil crayon because uh, that is always interesting for people because it's seen as a child's medium really in the South. You don't see many artists using pencil crayon as mature artists. Um, that actually is a very interesting history because when the co-op started in the 50s, they, you know, tried bringing up different materials. They had, you know, graphite pencils. Um, later, they had like a felt tip marker, um, but they uh, didn't really work because they weren't stable. They would fade very quickly. Um, and then they brought the pencil crayons up because the paint that they would bring up would freeze. And so the uh, pencil crayon has been used for generations as when people use color. Um, and it, it seems to be the uh, 
medium of choice up there. Um, not that they haven't had workshops, you know, getting artists to try different things, but it seems certainly for Shuvenai, that's her, her preferred uh, way to put color on the page. She's done other things, but that would be the color. As for the large scale, that's relatively new. Um, Tip, like historically, not typically, historically, uh, the papers were brought up in very domestic sizes, like a 30 by 40 inch page in blocks. And now they, they bring them up in rolls of paper. And uh, it is in my, like my memory. So the last 20 years, uh, they started getting artists to experiment with a bit bigger page. Um, and Part of that was because in museums in the South, you know, if you're going to put someone's drawing in a museum, you know, many art, contemporary artists work very large and uh, Inuit artists were kind of positioned as a domestic art that you would put in your house. And so um, when Annie Pudugu did her exhibition at the power plant in 2006, we sent up a large piece of paper for her to experiment in a large scale. And it's much more difficult to do that, obviously, because that's a big pencil crayon drawing. Um, and that drawing was of the co-op freezer and the National Gallery bought it right away. So there was a real uptake in terms of having these large drawings um, alongside other contemporary artists from the South or not um, in a museum situation where the walls are big and the rooms are big. And uh, I think of all the artists I've seen use the large scale, like certainly many have been um, successful at it, but Shuvenai really takes command of the paper and really, um, knows how to really work the large scale paper like no other artists up there really. Um, and I think that's a, a significant change in what's happening in Cape Dorset right now is, you know, the artists can work on whatever size of paper they want. It almost feels like Shivani's imagination is so expansive that she'll just fill whatever you give her to draw on. Yeah, it's true. She really doesn't run out of ideas. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, you were speaking, you know, how how is she so different from all the other artists that are working? Certainly there are, you know, she's very imaginative. She's very fanciful. She really does, um, rely on her imagination uh, more than looking out a window, for example. But there's also many things within her work that are also quite traditional that she has seen in other artists' work. Um, you know, those may not be the, the pictures that have sold over the years because a lot of the buyers still typically would purchase, a, you know, a seal hunt or, you know, a, a polar bear or things like that. But um, certainly artists in the North, I've seen them, you know, draw shamans and draw animal life and, and more surreal scenes. Shivanai takes it to the next level, I think, but um, um, she's, yeah, she's just amazing, amazing. Can you tell me a bit about the things that she draws? Um, is she telling specific stories in her artworks? I mean, she, she often incorporates these incredible beings, these creatures or monsters that are um, have tentacles and claws and enormous world heads. Who are, who are those creatures? What, what are, where are they coming from and, and what, what stories are they telling? Well, that remains a mystery, unfortunately, Jenny, because uh, in my discussions with her, she really doesn't follow a narrative. Uh, sometimes she will, like the piece in your exhibition called Titanic, that, that's a, you know, her interpretation of the sinking of that ship from the movie, the James Cameron movie. 
Um, so that would be one example where she is telling a specific story, but by and large, uh, she combines a lot of different uh, motifs for sake of another world. We have another word. We have uh, the globes. We have eggs. You often see eggs in the picture. You see animal life, um, specifically animals from the north, polar bear, char, seals, uh, walrus, narwhals. And then you see the morphed creatures that usually have something a, something from an animal like an octopus, but yet the octopus, uh, one of its tentacles is actually made out of globes. And then at the end of the globes, there's like bear claws. So she does, um, you know, I, I imagine she just, keeps drawing and sees what comes out at the end of the pencil. I don't think she's telling specific stories. Um, I think she's making compositions uh, that, that make, well, I hate to even say this, but make her laugh, make her um, happy. Um, she'll just put the pencil down and keep it going like it, it just, flows out of her like water. It's, it's really wonderful to hear you talk about it that way, because as a viewer, when you encounter one of her works, I find that most of them are very joyful and funny and, and playful because there's so many details that you, as you get sort of sucked into one of the pictures, you keep finding almost these little treasures, these little Easter eggs that she's hidden for people to find, maybe just for her own amusement. But there also seems to be this sort of sense of everything touches or it's interconnected. Is there something that you see there in terms of the interconnectedness? Well, I definitely see it in almost all the pictures. Uh, very rarely does one figure exist in total isolation. It's usually somehow connected uh, to a globe or an arm, or uh, you know, a human will be hugging another human, but their um, arms are like uh, crab legs. Um, there is. I don't know if it's an intentional attempt at her doing this, but I think it's the way she draws as well. You know, she's not setting out a scene. She's creating a composition. And so as she's drawing, you know, I think she goes, well, this arm could just morph into this octopus that could go into this snake that, is full of globes and then comes around and winds around the shoulders of a person. You know, like I don't, um, and I've talked to her many times about, you know, what are you doing, you know, as a curator? What are you saying? What is, is this a picture of your friend? Is this, you know, your cousin? And and she's so non-committal, you know, it's, it's just like you say, it's the trick is with her is to look deeply. And I've looked at these drawings for so many years and honestly, I still see something new almost every time um, because she does, you know, insert, like you say, these, these, uh, these joyful little things like bugs or spiders or, a little like snake that has legs. Um, so in terms of explaining her process, it's it's difficult as a curator to do that because you don't want to put words in the artist's mouth and you don't want to take away from this game she's playing with us in a way. So I love the fact that, you know, she's been a you know, equated to a surrealist, I like she's not, but, you know, there are some things that are, are surreal and are, you know, involve taking a leap of faith and just looking at the, at the picture for 
for what it is and making your own judgments about what what you think she's thinking. In a way, um, again, it's like she's giving these gifts to the viewer because there is no rule about what we're supposed to see. There's no conclusion that we're supposed to come to. She's just offering an experience. And you almost feel like you could fall into or step into one of her works and, and enter a whole other world that is almost, um, it almost keeps going. It's like one of those pictures that within pictures, within pictures, within pictures that sort of goes on for uh, infinity. Yeah. And you could like ride along on the, the waves of color and, and visit one of the planets that she's imagined in the distance. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. One thing that's really fascinating about Shivanai's work is the shifts in perspective. She often depicts more than one, like you're seeing something from straight on, you're seeing something from above, from a bird's eye view. Can you talk a bit about that? Because there are so few artists in the world who, who do that well shifting perspective and and um often when you look at a work that there's one point that you're looking from and that's the window that you're looking into but that's not the case with Shivanai's work yes it, she's she's amazing at shifting perspective but a lot of Inuit artists have done that um in the past as well um typically where you would see an aerial view um in an older drawing like something from the 50s would be a hunting drawing or a, um, a, a map, so to speak, like where a camp might be with um, signifiers of certain like Inukshuk or, you know, a little mountain or a lake. Um, and that was done by artists who had never been in an airplane. You know, it's just the knowledge of the land. So she certainly would be familiar with, with that sort of perspective. Um, and her work is still fairly flat, you know, in terms of, you know, she's not trying to replicate things to look hyper-realistic, but she will like, um, in, in the one drawing that's in your exhibition, she has an aerial view of the classroom. And then there's one little boy who's looking up at the viewer, which is, which is really interesting because she's not um, doing that like from a photograph and she's doing that trick of the child looking up to to really bring the viewer into the scene from the air, but acknowledge that we know that you're there. So I love that she did that in that drawing. I'm, I'm curious to hear you talk about some of these works that have come up as we've been enjoying the artworks on the walls at Glumbo. Um, some of them just, you just need to talk about because there's so much <laughs> happening. <laughs> Let me show you this one. Um, this one's called Earth Transformation. Well, this is one of my favorite ones. I really love when the artists use black paper. Shuvenai is not the only artist to use black paper, but I find them very dynamic and very dr dramatic. Um, what Shuvenai would have done in this case is um, use a white uh, Conte crayon or white pencil crayon to make you know, kind of the outlines as opposed to a fine liner. Uh, in this picture in the top left, you see one of her globes, which we see a lot of in that exhibition. But this globe is an aerial view of the community. Um, you could see the tops of the houses and some boats. And um, so there's a reference to place and there usually is in Shuvenai's work somewhere. Um, the, the globe is uh, held up by uh, human legs with blue nail polish, which is again, uh, very funny. Um, and the tentacles of the octopus you can see are, a couple of them are inverted, but you can see the detail of the suction cups in the um, in the tentacles, which kind of look like flowers to me. 
And two of the arms are made out of globes, two of the octop octopus arms. And if you note on the end of the, the tentacle, they have little crab claws that are added on um, almost like hands. And what is, what is uh, particularly interesting is the man, the hunter who's holding the picture, one of his hands is also made out of globes with little crab claws. And then the other one is a mitten. So I'm not sure why she would do that, but I guess that's part of our interconnectedness. Um, there's also a trope in Inuit art where you see art pictures that artists have made of them holding up pictures. And um, you know, you could almost make an exhibition of examples of this work. So this hunter is holding up a picture that maybe he's made. That's how they will show their drawings, you know, to the buyer at the co-op, for example. Um, and within that picture is a, another hunter who's holding what appears to me to look like a stretched canvas. I, I don't think it is. I think it's a blind uh, for hunting. Um, but one could assume if it was a picture, it might be the picture of the picture that the hunter is holding up. That's kind of my theory on it. But again, you, you know, the composition, the blue parka, the purple tentacles, this green and blue kind of uh, festival of colors that are the globes, you know, just a lovely composition. So this one is called The World in Her Eyes. And this is the one where I sort of feel like you could just like slide <laughs> on the drawing and, and yeah. just enter the world. Yeah, for those people who don't have the opportunity to see the exhibition, this is a very large drawing. Um, it's one of my favorite drawings. I just absolutely adore it. Uh, everything about it to me is right. Um, starting with her pink parka at the bottom, just to ground the drawing. Um, the world in her eyes, um, we must keep in mind that these titles are not given by the artists. Um, they're usually titled by the co-op and sent south and they're usually descriptive titles. So, uh, you know, a quick lesson in Inuit art for people, um, don't try to interpret too much into the title. Um, but um, I don't know who the her is, but I know the eyes are globes. So again, we see this globe uh, motif that, that she ran with for quite a while. And so we start with her face, her eyes are globes. If you see her, um, her left ear is a swan and you can see um, the swan's wing is just touching the corner of the eye and it, curls around its head and forms the shape of an ear. And resting on top of that swan is a walrus. Um, and the hair, so to speak, or hat, suppose, is a polar bear. Polar bears do have a yellowish tinge, so it's probably why the polar bear was done in that color. Uh, and then there's a serpent that winds its way, again, connecting all of these figures together um, that wraps its way from the bottom left around the top, ending on her hair at the top right. And his fangs are grabbing yet another globe. And his body also has globes all throughout the body as well. And just to, to kind of finish off is this wonderful hair that is every color of hair. 
Um, you know, you have brown, you have blonde, you have red, you have black, you have gray, you have white. Um, and it's just spectacular the way the colors and the movement um, just extend out to the end at the far right of the drawing, which has tiny little globes at the end of every strand of, or not every strand, but many strands of hair. And I find even just looking at the hair, if you were to block that part of the drawing off, you would have a spectacular drawing in and of itself. So again, a very, um, you know, creative, fanciful, uh, beautiful, happy picture that brings in you know, things that are indigenous to her life, the animals. Um, it is a white woman. Uh, so, you know, Shubhanai does not live in a world where it seems uh, color as evidenced also in the hair um, really matters often. It's, it's a mix of everything in her world. You know, it's a mix of animals and people and people of all different kinds and people embracing uh, the world and, you know, very uh, lovely, lovely picture. This is the one that we were talking about earlier with the um, the studio space with people drawing and, and writing stories and um, and there's the the boy in the middle ground that is looking up at the viewer and sort of recognizing that we're here watching. Yeah. Um, there's so much going on in this one. Can you tell me about how you see it? Well, I see it more as a school um, than the studio, uh, but I I don't know for. For fact, it's just maybe the fact they're all drawing. There's a lot of clues in the um, the things people are writing. A lot of it is in Inuktitut, uh, which with the syllabics. So that is, you know, next to impossible for many people to understand. Um, but you also see uh, some things that she's referred to, uh, Linda Blair. Uh, the Exorcist is one of her uh, favorite movies. Uh, you see Thor and Apex, iPad, so Thor would be comic book. Apex is an area in Iqaluit where people, like a subdivision, I guess, of Iqaluit. Um, iPod, name, you know, people writing different stories, but you know, you don't really know what people are doing. They all look very intent and very industrious. But what really skews the uh, composition is the bottom right corner with this monstrous um, figure. You can see the long arm reaching out towards the desk at the bottom and, you know, with a bunch of papers. Um, on one of the papers, there's a number of mouths and they go from close to screaming. Um, so I look at it as a very um, tormented mind, perhaps. Um, I'm not sure, uh, but it seems to be doing its thing and everyone else seems to be doing their work and then this little boy is looking up at us maybe asking like why I don't know um, it's a very curious drawing and um, like you said one of the few that she's done from an aerial point of view although she has done other ones um, usually um, they're they're about a place like she's describing a place but this doesn't seem to be a place this seems to be uh, you know, a bit of madness in the bottom right corner. Yeah, I like how she never gives us an answer. There's, you can sort of imagine yourself as one of the people in the space doing the work or as the monster trying to yeah. figure out how things work or, or how to be or what emotions to feel. 
Yeah, or maybe, you know, again, maybe we're all speculating here, which is, <laughs> which is the intent, but maybe, you know, that is yet another student. Um, and that's what's going on in the student's mind. And that's what's fun about her work is that you can see whatever you bring to it. Yeah. Now this one I love because to me, it's so playful and funny uh, with the gaggle of polar bears playing in the lap of the person um, as if polar bears could be shrunk into kitten size or gerbil size. And then the human is taking photos of the whole thing. Yeah, it, this one is, uh, again, a lovely uh, play on, you know, a very dangerous animal, like, um, that are just frolicking on his belly and he's taking a picture, not unlike you might do with your cat, you know. Um, uh, again, I'm not sure what got into her her mind doing that she does have a lot of pictures of people taking pictures and she does carry a camera around um and it doesn't really work that well but she you know i think it's a viewfinder for her so maybe um that's what she's doing with the the person taking the picture of this gaggle of bears because you gaggle of bears I'm sure it's not what is it called a herd of bears I'm not even sure um but you know you imagine what is in that viewfinder and that would be you know just a bunch of bears playing um which you probably wouldn't see <laughs> unless you know they were just newly born and they were uh in the den or whatever but um yeah curious choice but again that's part of her her reality you don't see cats up in cape dorset um so maybe she's just thought this would be a funny idea of a bunch of baby i don't even know if they're meant to be babies i assume they are um just like in in kind of a tumble um and the way the man is laid out and the color blocking is is you know such that the bears really are the central point of the drawing um which again goes back to her sense of of space and composition and just color she's really wonderful with color and really works the pencil crayon quite hard you know she doesn't um skip on detail by like shading like we might do and you know the typical trim on a on a parka in Cape Dorset would be that uh I don't know if you call it bric-a-brac or like that zigzag um trim and she's she, you know she spent a lot of time you know adding the details the zipper again he's a yellow-haired man I don't know if it's anyone specific with blue eyes, but again, that is not something Shuva and I really, she will draw people specifically, um, um, but more, more in general, like not, not trying to make a, you know, an accurate representation of that person. It occurs to me that this could be one bear in different positions at different times. Yeah, with her sense of perspective, it sure could be. Although they look like they're having quite a bit of fun. And that's what <laughs> I love about it. <laughs> it's this just tumble of bears. Just, yeah. I don't, I can't really, it's hard to imagine polar bears being cuddly, but she's definitely done it here. Yeah. No, again, what, what I want to reiterate with, um, with the exhibition and with Shuvenai's work is really the sense of joy that you get. Um, people, you know, often approach it and go, oh, you know, there's monsters and the, but if you look closely, there's, there's no malice in, in the work really. There's, you know, just 
a playfulness that you don't see in a lot of contemporary art these days. And this is, is this the first exhibition of her work, like museum solo show? Yeah, it's the first solo exhibition and it's been to six museums. I think you're the last. Um, and uh, it's been really such a success everywhere it's gone. I think it's really changed people's ideas about Inuit art and what Inuit art can be and what it doesn't have to be and that it's art, it's contemporary art made by an Inuk and um, it's different. It has its own sense of place and references, but you know, it's not a dancing bear. And I think for years, you know, that's all we were shown. And, um, you know, lots of people were making very um, creative things. We just weren't shown those things or they weren't popular with the buyers. Um, I think Shuvenai um, really has broken through into more of the world of contemporary art. And that is a global world. And there's no reason an Inuit artist should not participate in that conversation. I think this is an interesting exhibition for audiences too, because it, it, so, um, it can be whatever you need it to be as a, as a viewer. It's a really uh, lovely way to come into a museum space and just be welcomed and to explore different ideas and to imagine even just the physicality of creating these works with the pencil crayon because it's such a uh, an accessible medium you can immediately picture what it feels like to the labor in it required to color those those giant swaths of color on these huge pieces of paper so i think there's a really interesting connection that that shivanai makes between herself as an artist and the world through these drawings yeah. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I really am excited that people will see it here in Calgary and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, my pleasure. Enjoy the show. It was so nice to meet you, Nancy. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. Bye.